In today's day and age, the healthcare profession is very highly regulated. In fact, it's more highly regulated than what most people think. And you don't have to look any further than the FBI website and go under uh, what they investigate and criminal priorities, and you'll see the healthcare fraud is listed. And the reason why is because the federal government pays for over 50% of all healthcare expenses in the United States, which uh, the healthcare expenses are about a trillion dollars, so half of that is $500 billion. And it's always accepted in the insurance industry that about 10% of all claims are false or fraudulent. So that comes out to be about $100 billion. So as one prosecutor said many years ago, there's a lot of meat for them to sink their teeth into. And also down below you'll see this thing called identity theft. And that's also a, a real threat in a doctor's office because you can have an unscrupulous staff member who has access to a full database of patients' insurance information, their names, social security numbers, and they could sell that on the street. And the way that you would find out about it is by the government coming in and maybe kicking in your doors. Uh, so you have to be really careful about uh, how you build things out today and also how you preserve your records, which I'm a big fan of electronic health records because it will actually tell you every time that somebody accessed your database and you can set up passwords, et cetera, et cetera, and not just have paper files anymore. In fact, go paperless. But with regards to healthcare fraud, many doctors, if I ask them if they're committing fraud, they say they're not. And what they don't understand is that fraud is not what you think it is. Fraud is what uh, somebody else might think that it is. And under the healthcare fraud statute, it just says that you build an insurance company for a service uh, that, that essentially wasn't coded correctly. And that's my loose interpretation of that. But um, if you bill out the wrong code, that is fraud. And my, in my seminars, I find out that doctors don't really understand the codes they're billing out. They don't understand the definitions. They don't document them correctly. And I don't believe that they're trying to do this intentionally. But the fact is, is that I always tell them it's not all your fault, but it's your problem. And uh, so at the seminars, we try to clear this up so you have a better idea and understanding of what some of the services are. But if you click on the FBI website, and drill down a little bit further. They talk about healthcare fraud and how it's carried out in different uh, segments. And some of the most prevalent schemes include billing for services or uh, items not rendered. Now, if I was to ask you if you did this, you would probably say no. And what you think I'm asking is, uh, or saying, or suggesting that no medical service of any kind was rendered. And they call that billing out ghost patients. Now, I'd venture to say that the vast majority, almost all of the healthcare providers don't do this. But what I also think about here and what the government infers is that the service was not rendered as described in the claim for payment. And what that means is that you billed it out incorrectly. And that's, this is just as much of a fraud trigger as the first bullet point up here. And I find this to be the greatest liability, in fact, in doctor's offices. Also, if you go under upcoding of services, this might be an evaluation and management service. It could be a therapy or a manipulation, maybe the time of the service, uh, you build it out for more time than what you should have. In other words, you build it for four units and should have been three or two when it should have been one. Uh, an evaluation and management code, uh, maybe you build it out as a 99205 or 204 and it should have been built as a 203. Um, I also see an inverse of this as doctors know about this and they know they don't know how to code, so what they do is they actually undercode. And by undercoding, uh, I find that when they undercode, they also underdocument. So maybe if they perform an 04, uh, they will actually bill it as an 03, but their documentation wouldn't even support an 02. So that's why it's important to get everything, um, all your documentation straight. Because if you perform an 04, let's go ahead and learn how to document it uh, very easily, in fact, uh, the right way, so that you can bill out for the 04 and you can justify it. Um, down here, uh, this is a, a key bullet point, too, that I'm sure if, if you review it and you look at it at face value, say, no, I don't do this. But I see a lot of doctors that actually do do this. And uh, you have to look at it like this. It's like a C-shaped curve. You might be on one side of it and say it's convex. But the government's on the other side saying it's concave. And you both might think that you're right. Uh, the point is there is one right way to look at things. So in this particular example, they're talking about a routine follow-up doctor's office visit that's being billed as an initial or comprehensive visit. Now, what you have to know here is that an initial or co comprehensive visit, especially initial visit, that they're talking about a new patient. And you have to know the definition of a new patient, and there's a, a, a time frame that defines a new versus an established patient. So if you don't know that, for example, if a patient comes into your office and they've been treated for lower back pain, but they get into a car accident, and uh, maybe they come in a week or a month or a year later, and you bill them out with another new patient code, like a 99203, 
uh, you're telling the insurance company that you have not seen that patient in the previous three years. Well, that's false and fraudulent, and it taints the entire case. So when you really understand how to use the code, you might realize that you are tripping over some of these wires, and you just want to stop doing it. Um, also, they talk about group therapy being billed as individual therapy. What they're talking about here is that maybe you've got three or four patients that are working out on different machines in the office, and you have one or two therapy assistants that are helping them out, um, and they're doing a great job doing it. The service is being done. The patients are getting better. That's not the issue. But the issue is here is that are, is each patient getting individual therapy, in other words, one-on-one -on -one therapy? And the CPT assistant actually defines one-on-one, -on -one, so it's not uh, always taken at face value. But uh, I've seen instances where people will go ahead and bill out uh, 10 patients who are in a pool as aqua therapy, and it makes perfectly good sense why you would do that. However, when you go back to the therapeutic procedure code and they talk about how the physician or therapist is required to have direct one-on-one -on -one contact with the patient, it brings out a couple of things. Number one, the physician or therapist, do they need to be licensed? And most people would say, yes, they do. However, your state might allow you to go ahead and delegate that authority to a trained individual. In some instances, they might need to be licensed. For example, Medicare says that you can't just be a medical doctor and go ahead and tell patients that they can do aqua therapy, that you actually have to refer that to a physical therapist and either the PT uh, who's licensed or the PT assistant is doing that under the auspices of the, uh, the medical doctor, and they call that incident too. However, if you're not billing Medicare, say you're billing major med or workers' compensation, and, um, and let's just say that you're a chiropractor, you might be billing this out to insurance companies. You have to make sure that, first of all, your state board allows you to bill it out this way, um, delegate your authority to an unlicensed individual, and the insurance companies are okay with that as well. You have to read your contracts, in other words. Um, so anyway, and then you have to, after you cross that bridge, it says one-on-one, -on -one, and you have to know what one-on-one -on -one actually means. So uh, I always say it's like a personal trainer. Just think of one-on-one -on -one as a personal trainer. You have somebody who's right there in the proximity, um, and that's, that was, would be an example of individual therapy. If you had 10 people in a pool with one or two people watching them, that would actually be group therapy. So my point is that I see a lot of individual therapy that's being billed out uh, as, say, like a 97110 for therapeutic exercise. And if, you're, if you don't have true one-on-one, -on -one, it really should be billed out as group therapy. And again, this is something that might be uh, innocent. Uh, so your, your E&M codes might be billed out incorrectly, maybe even downcoded, upcoded. Uh, when patients come back in, you might be tainting your case by picking out the wrong E&M service. Uh, and then it, when you're picking out therapy, you might be billing out for an individual therapy when group therapy should be uh, billed out instead. Also on the FBI website, they talk about excessive services. And anybody who performs physical medicine of any type, whether you be a physical therapist or a medical doctor that does therapy in your office, a uh, doctor of chiropractic, this is of great concern because uh, they're talking to you about these services here. Uh, you know, why is it that some uh, therapists or doctors can go ahead and get patients, quote, better in eight visits and, you know, some it takes 40. You'll be challenged on that. You have to uh, know when we talk about this, how you distinguish the different types of services in your office, pain relief versus uh, uh, treatment or therapy that increases function or maintenance care. We have to know when the patient is crossing all of these thresholds. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we can address this issue. This gets into what they call uh, a medically necessary treatment. And uh, I'm sure we've all had peer reviews as, as healthcare providers where they say the treatment is not medically necessary. Um, the best way to address this, and we'll talk about this at the seminar, is using outcome assessments. Because if you can uh, use something like, say, range of motion or strength testing or dynamic EMG that shows muscle firing patterns, as the patient is getting better, it's not just subjective with the symptoms, but we can actually take a look objectively and quantify this um, as well, and we'll know when the patient is still making improvement, uh, which would justify treatment in our office versus when they plateau. It's very easy to do, but this is a critical thing that we have to address uh, because uh, when somebody challenges you on the number of visits that it, it takes, you know you want to be able to say, look, you know, I uh, we were trying to increase function, we performed certain tests to evaluate that, and it is what it is. Certain providers might just get patients out of pain. And so if you compare me to them, it might not be an accurate uh, comparison. So again, excessive services are, are fall under what I call medically unnecessary services as well, So, which is what we basically were talking about. And you see the word fraud here, or medically unnecessary. We want to avoid these uh, at all costs. Uh, when it comes back to kickbacks, this is really important also in today's day and age to address. 
in Medicare or any federal claim, you don't want to give away anything for free at all, ever. And we talk about that during the seminar. Also, with major med insurance today, they're starting to get more sensitive as to why we're giving away, uh, in some instances, doctors might be giving away free exams that are valued at $640, and they give it away for 20 bucks. And then insurance companies are saying, well, how come you're billing us the full $680 on other, you know, other instances? How come what's good for the goose isn't good for the gander? And that's starting to cause a lot of problems for doctors. For years, the insurance companies, even state boards, have given doctors a lot of latitude, and today uh, they're tightening up. So these are the types of things that we address at the seminar. Uh, we talk about your evaluation and management codes, uh, your therapy codes. If you're a doctor of chiropractic or osteopathy, we talk about your manipulation codes. Especially if you're a chiropractor, you want to make sure that you're not documenting an osteopathic code and then billing out a, a chiropractic manipulative treatment code. Because believe it or not, even though the RVU or the reimbursement for an OMT, an osteopathic manipulative treatment, might be higher than a CMT, the chiropractic manipulative treatment, if you uh, document one thing but bill for the other, even if it's a lower price, you can be uh, challenged and they can just say that that's actually an example of fraud or false billing and uh, that taints the entire case. So the point is we want to learn how to code things accurately because the introduction of the CPT codebook says to choose the code that accurately identifies the service or procedure provider and to not merely approximate. So again, this is what the government focuses on. This is what I focus on at the seminars. We get into a lot of other things, such as how to document these services as well. So not only do you want to pick out the right service, but you also want to document it correctly because during an audit or an investigation, uh, your documentation is what is going to back up the services that have been provided. So uh, anyway, give you some insight as uh, what the government's looking at and what I focus on as well at the seminars.